So we're going to start today talking about chapter 11. Now, we're not going to spend much time on chapter 11. We're going to put more focus onto chapter 12. But chapter 11 deals with the auditing of the cycle as it relates to acquiring um, goods, the receipt of goods, and the payment of goods within the inventory system. Um, basically, as we've talked about this integrated audit, we know that many of the um, assertions that management um, uses for the financial statements are those things that we're going to audit. And the same is true here with the acquisition cycle. Now, as you can see here, this identifies the um, purchases of products, services, um, and it also includes the purchase ordering of them, the approval of any payments, paying for those goods and services, and the receipt of those goods and services. Accounts that are included in this cycle would include inventory, cost of goods sold, expenses, and there could be some accounts payable. Remember, we're not just focused on making sure our liabilities are accurate. We're also concerned with that debit side of the transaction. So when we're dealing with the liability, where we credit a liability, the debit may be an inventory, it could be an expense, or it could be an asset. And we want to make sure that we record correctly those items that should be expensed versus those items that should be capitalized along with the inventory. So the activities we're dealing with in this particular cycle involve um, requesting the goods, the requisition of those goods, and then the purchase of the goods, making sure that the policies the companies initiated regarding who can in fact purchase those goods who are the vendors we use, how the approval process works. We want to make sure those internal controls are in place. Then we are going to look at how those goods or those services are received in the documentation of receipt of those, along with the process to have those items paid for, and then the payment of that completes this entire process. So we're going to look at all the various aspects of this cycle. In times 20 years ago, there was a manual system for purchasing. Now we've become so automated, there's an automated system, but we still need to make sure that automation is functioning as expected. Generally, in this automated system, there's software that pre-approves the vendors and along with their pricing. And the system basically is beneficial to companies in the fact that many of these items, if we can trust the, that the system's correct, does have procedures in place that um, specify exactly what vendors we're able to use and what those select pricing components are in, within the system. Um, they're loaded in the, the software automatically and then when uh, things may be amiss there's going to be a flag related to that. Um, the phase one and two of that formulation process, again, we've gone through this with the other cycles, but we're always updating information when we get information available on the risk, any type of business risk, and we want to be aware of how employees could p potentially um, encourage misstatements or, or what would be those motivations for misstatements to be occurred in this um, cycle. Now we need to be aware that this is a high risk cycle when we're dealing with the payment and the receipt and the acquisition of goods. This is a high risk cycle and we need to really make sure those internal controls are functioning as expected within the company. Um, and as a result of that, can maybe um, put some trust in those internal controls in place. But this is still a high risk <coughs> cycle within <coughs> the accounting system. 
Then as we move on to the phase three and four of this process, we need to um, pay attention to those controls that need to be tested, then develop a plan for testing the controls, look at the results, and based on those results of trusting the controls, performing some various additional tests, um, substantive in nature. So acquisition cycle, we're dealing with receipt of goods and services. Now, just because of the mere volume of the transactions we're dealing with, there can be misstatement and high risk just due to volume. What are some of the frauds that may take place? Well, theft. Theft is an easy one um, when we're dealing with employees. So we need to make sure there are controls in place to limit or minimize that theft. Employee schemes involving fictitious vendors as a means to transfer payments to themselves. So that's where it's important to see those pre-approved vendors. And if in fact those vendors are pre-approved, that that system is working. Executives misusing travel and entertainment accounts. Schemes to classify expenses as assets. We would want to classify an expense as an asset because it reduces our net income excuse me, it increases our net income and it increases our assets at, and as a result um, makes the company look more favorable than in fact they are. We know that expenses are put on the income statement and are written off in that current period whereas to put something as an asset shows that there would be a continued benefit in future periods. And then reserves. There are various reserves that we'll use for um, allowances, for um, returns and allowances, and we just want to make sure that those um, estimates are in place and the manner in which they come about. So inventory, there are ways to be able to look that something's goofy or amiss in this cycle. The fraud indicators would show that inventory is growing at a rate that's greater than sales. Why would inventory be growing at a greater rate than sales? They're not being sold? Ex what? They're stockpiling? Expenses are significantly either above or below the industry average. Um, capital assets are growing faster than the business for which there are no strategic plans. You know, generally companies will um, earmark and have long-term plans in place for capital asset growth. So when you see that growth without any corresponding um, um, minutes, then probably something's amiss there. And then reserves get reduced. Reserves getting reduced becomes more favorable to a company. Is there documentation to be able to substantiate or justify the reduction in reserves, or is that a manipulation to the company's books? Um, other things that can be of concern to this cycle, expense accounts get a lot of credit entries. What does a normal expense account have? What's the normal balance? A debit balance, why are they getting credited? Travel and entertainment expenses don't have documentation. Inadequate follow-up to auditor recommendations on needed controls. So when we see that in prior um, audits, we've made recommendations and we can tell now we're in a uh, new year that those recommendations weren't heeded. That might be something we're going to look a little stronger at. S payments to senior officers in the form of loans get forgiven. Wow. What would that ultimately, what should that ultimately be? Like it's some type of income. When there are loans issued to um, officers and then they're forgiven, there should be some type of income that is um, related to their W-2. So we are going to first start by looking analytically and seeing it in an overall scope where we um, see some things that are off 
kilter to what they've been in previous years or the industry average. Calculate and analyze dollar and percent changes in inventory, cost of goods sold, and expense accounts. So we did the same thing as we were working with BuiltRight, didn't we? And didn't we notice that the cost of goods sold when we were kind of doing our ratios went really down from one year from one year and then the next year it went really down? That's an analytical procedure just to see generally from year to year things should be consistent. We look at ratios like inventory turnovers and numbers of days, sales, and inventory to help us con deal with a consistency in the company as it is within the industry. These types of ratios and procedures are going to give us some insight that something is um, either in line with previous years or something's amiss that needs further um, looking into. We can prepare these common sized income statements to identify cost of goods sold or expense accounts that are out of line. So these common sized income statements, we can show relationships of various in, um, expenses to the overall expenses or expenses to sales to make sure that they're in line. So we're gonna look at this and then from that gather evidence or information as to how to proceed with what appears to be out of line. Requesting goods and services. We need to look at the process. These requisition forms that are pre-numbered help us to see completeness, don't they? That we have in fact um, accounted for each requisition form. For purchasing goods and services, those purchase orders are going to show the quantity we're purchasing, the price, the various specifications and terms of, of shipping, along with other information. And again, these purchase orders should be pre-numbered because those pre-numbered purchase orders and requisition forms really enable us to know that we are accounting for every one of them. They need to be authorized. Who is the correct individual to authorize those purchases? And many times there is a separate purchasing department within large firms, mainly to keep it centralized. And the other benefit, there are instances that happen quite often where you get your favorite friend to their um, selling a specific product. And so instead of making sure you've got the um, the best vendor, you may um, choose to have someone where potentially there can be some collusion involved. So centralizing the purchasing is a great idea just for the mere fact of making it more efficient and um, making sure that the vendors are the pre-approved vendors or the that um, are going to provide you with the best product for the price. Then when the goods get received, it should come in within the receiving department and the receiving department should make sure that only those goods we really requested and put as a purchase order are those that we're getting a receiving and that they meet the guidelines stated on the purchase order. We make sure that we actually did receive the number we ordered. So taking account on those items received is a great idea and then after we received all those items, did we record it appropriately? Again, pre-numbered. You're going to hear that over and over again, how these pre-numbered um, documents are essential to make sure we have um, a completeness assertion that we are, have actually taken into account each one. The Receiving reports after they've been um, filled out will then be sent to the accounting department. Then accounting is going to match the purchase order, the receiving report, along with the vendor invoice, match them to make sure that all the various factors in volume, price, quality are met. And this can happen in a traditional system or an automated system. 
from there, once the payment's been approved, the money or the, the form of payment will be um, dispersed and we've completed that cycle. Now, is the supporting documentation, do we know it's attached to it? Is it, um, is it correct? Has it been approved? And then once this has all gone through the cycle, we want to make sure we don't pay it again. So stamping paid on all of those various documents helps us um, avoid having duplicate payments. Okay, so to test these controls, we're going to um, follow some certain procedures. Again, the common thread here is would accounts payable be overstated or understated? The common thread for us to look for as an auditor is to know that the accounts payable would tend to be understated. That would be the norm within a company and to understate expenses. So we usually are going to follow through with the controls to make sure the appropriate authorization occurred, that completeness of recording, that's going to help us in all the pre-numbered um, documents to make sure we have included all of them. We've recorded them in the right time, in the right period, and that the valuation, are we recording them at the appropriate quantity and price? Okay? We can do this by picking um, a, a grouping of these um, um, purchase orders and attribute sampling can be used, the various forms of sampling can be used to test a series of the, the paperwork to see how those controls have played out. Was it authorized by the right person? Was it re recorded in the software in th um, thoroughly? What about the timing? When was it recorded? and was it recorded with all the appropriate values. So based on what the results are of this sampling is going to decide for us what other type of testing we're going to have to do afterwards. So as we do some of this sampling on these, this cycle here, we're then going to, based on those results, decide hey, we might need to really up the amount of substantive testing we're going to do based on how the sample comes back in testing those controls. Again, if you saw on the test, the question is the auditor's main concern in this cycle that the accounts payable would be understated or overstated? What would be the correct answer? Understated. So it's making sure the completeness assertion is adhered to. Completeness meaning have they accounted for every single payment purchase order? And what helps us in making sure completeness is adhered to? The pre-numbered documents, we can make sure every single one has been put in the system, okay? And then from this, we can conduct um, after we find out how our controls are working, we can take a look at other related accounts and just analyze them based on previous years of um, ratios. We can look at other disbursements to see um, when they were actually paid out. And from those other disbursements, we can look back to see the period in which it should have been recorded versus when it might, might have been recorded. And we can also reconcile the vendor statements to confirm our accounts payable, to make sure that everything has been, in fact, recorded. Um, analytical reviews make sure that our expenses are adequate, that, that we're not understating anything. Again, when we look at analytical reviews, a percent, to total expenses or a percent to the sales, 
a lot of times that's going to be consistent year after year. If something's amiss, we're going to want to look and see why. And if there is a reason or why, maybe we would still perform testing. But if there's not, if there shouldn't be a change of percentages from one period to the next, then we're probably going to expand some tests to see why it is so much lower than it we anticipate it to be. Um, auditors sample cash disbursements after the end of the year. So basically at the end of the year, going into the next year, the auditor can take a list of those disbursements to see when in fact they were recorded as a payable. Um, from there, you take those disbursements, decide in those based on those transactions, was it appropriate that the documents were posted in the current year or should they have been posted in the year of audit? And you can vouch backwards. Remember, vouching is going backwards, back to the source documents to see if, in fact, those were recorded appropriately. And then if the disbursements for the audit year, then the auditor reprocesses the transaction to see if it was properly recorded as a payable. And so these are various types of testing we can do to ensure that the, the accounts receivable were valued correctly, that we've got um, um, existence and com completeness. Again, auditors can request the monthly statements from the vendors, or they can send out a confirmation to the vendors so they get a list of um, what would be due on a specific time. Okay. Um, substantive audit procedures as it relates to this cycle is, um, would be conducted through these detailed tests of transactions we're talking about. Continually doing analytical reviews, comparing accounts between one another um, is always a healthy way or a, a smart way for an auditor to see if they're in line. And reviewing transactions that may seem unusual. Lots of credits to and travel and entertainment seems fishy. Lots of credits to any expense would give rise to want to review those. Large transactions are another thing you would want to review. Now, what can create a more complex audit? When we are just dealing with our built right, and with built right, we're dealing with um, certain products that are going to come into the inventory, or certain continued types of transactions happen because all we really build are bicycles. But can you see when the variety of products that are being produced um, become expounded or expanded, how that can create more complexity because you're dealing with so many more types of products in the purchasing cycle? Or when there's lots of volume, just the mere fact of volume can create potential errors Another one that's tough, this would be especially true when we're dealing with technology. Obsolete inventory, defective inventory, are we making sure that we're writing that inventory off or is it still listed on the books? So when we're dealing with changing inventory, that's really something as an auditor, you need to be able to get in there and understand if that inventory is in fact even um, worth something. And you're going to deal with that when we're dealing with um, t high technology. Can you think of another reason inventory may become defective or obsolete? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Correct. That's the only one I can really think of off the top of my head. It relates to technological changes. Um, but even when we're dealing with, you know, inventory, I'm just even thinking of a home, say. There are trends that occur. 
And so where white appliances might be the cool thing, and then they turn to stainless steel, it's not as though it's a defective inventory, but they're not as desirable with the new trends coming in. As Can you see in the various magazines, all of the new appliances are now, like the, the mixers, they're all becoming green again, <laughs> that old green. Things, things take on, based on just personal appearances, um, become a more favored item. It might be the same product, but just based on the, um, as it relates to the cool factor, may um, reduce the values of those inventory. Many frauds involve the inventory account, so um, definitely a high-risk area. We're also dealing with inventories getting returned. We're not just dealing with um, people being able to walk off with inventory. Inventories um, can be returned, and we need to make sure those are accounted for right. We also have to deal with all of the various um, warehouses um, and all the locations where inventory can be stored. Um, again, inventory frauds, a common management manipulation, so the earnings are inflated and it makes the financial position of the company look more desirable. So when we're dealing with in internal controls as it relates to inventory, we need to make sure purchases are authorized. Accounting systems ensure timely, accurate, and complete recording. We need to make sure they were recorded in the, at the proper time. And the inventory, when it was received, it was accounted for timely. And we make sure that the valuation, everything was recorded um, with what was received. The costs are identified. The products are reviewed for any obsolescence in the inventory system. That would have to be a physical check. Um, new products are introduced only after market studies. How many of you guys, maybe you might not remember this, but back in the 70s, Coke came out with a, um, some people think it was a marketing ploy, but they came out with a new product called New Coke. And for me, it bombed because I wouldn't drink it. I would rather drink Pepsi than the Coke because it was sweeter. And um, some people still to this day say they think that was a marketing ploy. But I don't really know if Coke would have gone through all those millions of dollars of expenses for a marketing ploy that really was unfavorable to them. But this is a perfect example why market groups, studies need to be really seriously um, developed before you put out so much money into the marketing and the production of a new product. Can you guys think of a product recently that has come out where you wonder if the company did their diligence in even testing the product before it hit the shelves? What's a Snuggie? Yeah, like a that was a goofy one. Yeah, yeah, the Snuggie. And, you know, being in Minnesota, we would be wanting those Snuggies if they were a great idea. What else? Can anyone think of something else? The shrink hose? Huh, I wonder how that works. So don't leave it out in the sun. And then if you leave it out in the winter, it's going to freeze and crack. Yeah. That's a tough one. So definitely something to look at how um, people they can spend a lot of money wastefully without making sure those products are going to be something the, the public wants. The types of assertions we are going to look at as it relates to inventory involve existence. That's where we're going to take a physical count. Completeness, we're going to test to make sure the cutoff dates were adhered to. Rights, 
Do we actually own these goods? Look at the contracts. Valuation, we're going to have to do some testing on those and analytic analytical procedures to make sure they're in line with previous years. And disclosures to make sure that any issues that are requiring footnotes are in fact disclosed in the financial statements. So when we deal with physical inventory, we're going to talk to the client to see how in fact they are planning on when they're going to conduct that physical count so we can be there for them, and how they account for all the inventory and tag it. And then from there, if there needs to be any specialists that are hired to account for or to determine certain sp specific items in inventory. Um, then from there, we just observe the procedures. Um, we should be able to see the first tag and the last tag number in all the sections of inventory. And that way, there can't be additional tags that get placed in a specific area. High do we're wanting to look at high dollar value items, items that may be defective. And we want to make sure I mean, sometimes there may be movement in the inventory, but we want to make sure that our inventory is complete and that items aren't getting double tagged here. After we do this inventory count, then the auditor is going to basically trace all of these test counts back to the client's records and make sure they trace the high dollar items to the records and then trace the damaged or defective obsolete items back to the um, client's records so we can see in, it has in fact been written down. Sometimes counting all this inventory isn't reality. So there may be times that it might have to be done at another time. It might not be able to be done at year end. And so there you'll do that at a di different times when you can trust the client's controls and um, the analytical procedures will are in line with the previous periods. Okay, um, let's see here, rights. When we're dealing with the assertion of rights, most of the work regarding the ownership of that inventory gets performed when we show the purchasing of that inventory. Because of the purchasing of that inventory, we'll be able to see, in fact, it was purchased through us and we'll see the documentation, purchased by us in the documentation. Um, looking for long-term contracts, it will help us see where we've got some future liabilities or debts. Um, and Again, is there inventory out there on consignment? If, in fact, there is, we need to know about it so we can uh, make sure that's not included in our assets of inventory. The valuation is a tough one. Valuating inventory or valuing inventory can be tricky just due to the mere number of transactions. And when products are much more diverse, that's going to make it a little more complicated. And costing methods. We've got all kinds of costing methods that we use to account for inventory. The average cost method, the LIFO, the FIFO. Because of all these various methods we're allowed to use, it can make the um, auditing of this inventory for evaluation purposes challenging. So um, as we move on with this valuation of inventory, direct testing and, again, those analytical procedures are really a good tool to use in making sure our inventory um, is valued accordingly. So we'll, as an auditor, the auditor can verify costs by looking at those vendor invoices and examine market information to see if certain inventory might be, you know, worthless or worth very little. 
and ask management things to find what possibly is could be obsolete looking at those ratios or the turnovers really help us see maybe those items that aren't moving as fast and when we're looking at the physical counting we can also be looking for obsolete inventory so as far as disclosures we're not going to worry about disclosures on um, this segment but again auditors are required to make sure that management in fact has reported um, the disclosures required based on certain guidelines with GAAP. Cost of goods sold can be directly tied to the audit of inventory. Absolutely. Um, if the beginning and in inventories have been verified and acquisitions have been tested, cost of goods sold can ultimately be calculated just based on our inventory audit. Auditors should apply analytics to cost of goods sold to see if there are any significant variations. Again, when we were looking at built right, in one of the years our cost of goods sold compared to our sales was extremely understated. Um, and so analytical procedures really help you see an overall view of if something potentially was recorded in the wrong period for a sale or if in fact the um, that cost of goods sold is still sitting in inventory instead of where it should be if it's no longer um, if it was in fact sold so in a nutshell guys that is what we're going to focus on for chapter 11 I would like to take a couple minutes and just go over some problems um, who let's see here let's look at I like going over some of the multiple choice. Let's. Okay, let's see here. Where's our multiple choice here? Starting with 1141. Let's look at this multiple choice here, and I'll pull up. Okay. So page six thirty six. Let's take a look at some of these multiple choice um, auditors use preliminary analytical procedures to help identify identify potential misstatements in inventory which of the following would not be useful for this purpose would it be a calculating inventory turnover B aging inventory C, comparing the percent change of inventory with the percent change in sales. Or D, all of the above would be useful. What would you guys think there? A, calculating inventory turnover. That, ca calculating inventory turnover is a good um, procedure. Aging inventory also is to look for obsolete. Comparing the percent change of inventory with the percent change in sale is definitely um, a beneficial uh, ratio. All of them would be. So the correct answer there would be D. Let's look at 1142. 
The auditor's analytical procedures are facilitated if the client does which of the following? <clears throat> a uses a standard cost system that produces variance reports. D segregates obsolete inventory before the physical inventory count. C corrects reportable conditions in internal controls before the beginning of the audit. Or D reduces inventory balances to the lower of cost or market. Which of those would be most helpful when an auditor's using analytical procedures? A, that cost, standard cost system that produces a variance report would definitely help an auditor understand those, um, those ratios um, because they are, they're producing that variance report based on those costings. Um, number 43, which of the following controls would be most effective in assuring that recorded purchases are free of material errors? A, the receiving department compares the quantity ordered on purchase orders with the quantity received indicated on receiving reports. B, vendors' invoices are compared with purchase orders by the employee who's independent of the receiving department. C, receiving reports require the signature of the individual who authorized the, pur the purchase. And D, accounts payable personnel match the purchase orders, the receiving reports, and the vendor's invoices before approval for payment. D would be the most complete, wouldn't it? The, the accounting um, employee is basically taking all the documents and making sure everything's in line before pay payment. Number 44, which of the following procedures in the cash disbursement cycle should not be performed by the accounts payable department? So this is going to be a, a control issue. Separation of duties. Which of the following in the cash disbursement shouldn't be performed by the accounts payable? Comparing the vendor's invoice with the receiving report. Canceling supporting documentation after payment. B, C, verifying mathematical accuracy of the vendor's invoice. Or D, approving the invoice for payment. B, canceling supporting document after payment. Why would that be a bad idea for them to do the canceling of the um, paperwork? Or they could, they could run it through a second time. So the fact that someone else does that work doesn't allow that um, control to, again, that opportunity to get in the way, okay? That would open up an opportunity for the um, accounts payable department. Number 45, to determine whether accounts payable are complete, an auditor performs a test to verify that all merchandise received is recorded. The population of documents for this test consists of all A, vendors invoices, B, purchase orders, C, receiving reports, or D, canceled checks. What? To determine whether accounts payable are complete, an auditor performs a test to verify all merchandise received is recorded. How do we know what is received? Receiving reports. Number 46, tracing debits from the inventory account to receiving reports and purchase orders provides evidence that A, all receipts of merchandise were properly recorded B, recorded inventory purchases 
were for goods received and were properly authorized? C, all vendor invoices have been properly recognized as a purchase and payable? Or D, inventory is not understated? What did you say? B, recorded inventory purchases were for goods received and were properly authorized. So we're going back and kind of vouching, guys, aren't we? We're taking our inventory account and we're going to take that inventory and we're going to go back to the source documents, aren't we? And from that, we're, we're realizing that our vendor invoices were properly recognized, excuse me, the, the um, purchases we're showing were for goods received and properly authorized because we're looking at the receiving report to see that it was received and we're looking at the purchase order, we're vouching back to see that it was properly authorized. Does that make sense, guys? Number 47. After accounting for a sequence of inventory tags, an auditor traces a sample of tags to the physical inventory list and recognize, reconciles the sequences counted to the inventory list to obtain evidence that all items A, included in the list have been counted, B, represented by inventory tags, are included in the list, C, included in the list are represented by inventory tags, or D, represented by inventory tags that are real. So they're taking a sample of tags to the physical inventory list and reconciling the sequences counted to the inventory list to obtain evidence that what? B, represented by inventory tags are in fact included in the list. Look, they're tracing a sample of tags to the physical inventory list and they're reconciling the sequences. So they're taking the tags and they're wanting to make sure that included in that list they're represented with those inventory tags. Um, let's take a look at number 50. Which of the following audit procedures is best for identifying unrecorded trade accounts payable. A, examining unusual relationships between monthly account balances and recorded cash payments. B, reconciling vendor statements to the file of receiving reports to identify items received just before the balance sheet date. C, reviewing cash disbursements recorded subsequent to the balance sheet date to determine whether those related payables apply to the prior period or D, investigating payables recorded just before and just after the balance sheet date to determine whether they are supported by receiving reports. C, again, we want to make sure that our accounts um, payable is complete and that everything's included in there. One way is to take those things that were paid after the cutoff date to make sure, in fact, we look at them and say, when did that transaction get posted? Was it posted in the right period? Okay, number 54. The auditor's inventory observation test counts are traced to the client's inventory listing to test for which of the following financial statements assertions. A, completeness, B, existence, C, valuation, or D, presentation and disclosure. So the inventories, the auditor's inventory observation test counts are traced to the client's inventory listing. What are we looking for, guys? Completeness, A. Okay, um, 
let's just real quick. No, let's see. Okay, well, I think the, the reality is we're going to be done with Chapter 11. Um, we will start on Chapter